people helping make this day possible. And before we begin, I want to thank the Village of Orland Park Parks Department, the Village's Veterans Commission, and everyone from Orland Park Boy Scout Troop 3D3, and our friends from Timmy Troop 442, who helped create this memorial for Captain Ron Zinn. Ron Zinn and his family moved to Orland Park from Peoria in 1953, when he was about my age now. He excelled in academics and track at Carl Sandburg High School, where he was named Most Valuable Athlete and graduated in 1957. He would go on to become the first U.S. Olympian in Sandburg's history, representing the United States as a race walker in the 1960 and 1964 Olympics. He earned track titles around the world and graduated from the Military Academy at West Point in 1962, and also was the first from Orland Park to die in Vietnam. I first learned about Ron Zinn two years ago when our troop created a historical geo challenge for the village's 120th anniversary. We saw the monument that now sits here on the hillside at Humphrey Woods and included it as a landmark in the challenge. When I read the plate on the monument, I decided that I wanted to do something more for this local and national hero and chose to make this my Eagle Scout project. Color Guard, attention! Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the presentation of colors. And kindly remove all heads. Color Guard, forward march. Please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Scout salute! I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. Fran Carnivelli will now sing the national anthem. Please join me. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous light for the ramparts we Watched, were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star spangled banner. Color guard dismissed. See, right, face. At this time, I'd like to introduce some of the honored guests and dignitaries we have with us. Um, everybody, please be seated first. So if I call your name, just please raise your hands to show everybody who you are. Uh, the Zinn family, thank you to Jerry Zinn, Joyce Zinn Owens, and their families for being here today. And the West Point class of 1962, we have six representatives from Captain Zinn's West Point class of 1962 joining us here today.
thank you to the members of the Orland Park Village Board who are also here this morning. Uh, here we have Mayor Dan McLaughlin, uh, Trustee Kathy Fenton, and Trustee Jim Dodge. If you guys could just raise your hands and show everybody who you are. Um, here from the Village of Orland Park Veterans Commission, will the veterans of the Veterans Commission please raise your hand. Let's give those guys a round of applause. I know we have a number of Vietnam veterans here today. Uh, can you guys please raise your hands? Now, veterans of any war, can you please raise your hands? Let's give these guys a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you to former Orland Park Veterans Commissioner Bob Smith for being here today, and thank you to the Warrior Riders. I've asked a few special people to come here and talk today, the first of which is our own Orland Park Mayor, Dan McLaughlin. Thanks, Tim. Good morning. What a great day. I hope you see here today what I see. It is absolutely a memorial for a long fallen hero, long ago fallen hero, a chance to remember Captain Ronald Zinn. But I think it's more than that. And I believe that Captain Zinn would feel pretty good about being the focus that brought us here today. This is small town America doing what a lot of people think is a thing of the past. A Boy Scout working for his Eagle Scout badge, organizing a memorial service and plaque dedication ceremony for a long forgotten soldier from our hometown. People from the community, including the local veterans groups helping out, and people from all over the country attending. As mayor, I couldn't be prouder than to call Captain Ronald Zinn one of our own and have the opportunity to recognize him today. And I couldn't be prouder of Tim Klotz as an Orland Park youth that has gone above and beyond to make today very special for the Zinn family and very special for Orland Park. I was a kid myself at the time, but like many of you, I was around when our boys were returning from Vietnam, including friends of our family. And to this day, I have a gut feeling of sorrow over how so many of those soldiers were treated on their return. Any opportunity to thank our Vietnam veterans and recognize their sense of duty and dedication to our country gives me a tremendous feeling of joy. But Captain Zinn's story is not your typical local soldier killed in the line of duty story. When a local Sandberg High School student or graduate makes the Olympics, like recently with Kendall Coyne, it's a big deal for us. When a Sandberg student goes on to West Point or one of the academies, it's a very big deal for us. If one of our citizens goes overseas in combat, like many today, it's a big deal. Captain Ronald Zinn was all of those. But that isn't even his whole story. He risked his life in battle, attempting to save his commander. Captain Ronald Zinn was a true American hero the kind of dedicated individual that made him excel in everything he did. And I'm honored to be here today to recognize him and honored that a plaque in his name will be in Orland Park. Thank you to the Zinn family and friends for attending today and thank you for your sacrifice. Your Ron did his part to keep the American dream alive. And thank you to Tim Klotz for all of your efforts today. We also have some of the leaders and committee members and families here from Orland Park Boy Scout Troop 3D3. Can you guys just raise your hands and show them that you're here? We have the scouts over here. They were the color guard, so thank you guys. Just a few weeks ago, some of those boys that you saw presenting colors, they helped make this a reality. They 
stayed out here for almost eight hours working in the hot sun to build Ronald's Inn a memorial. So please join me in round of applause for our Boy Scout Troop 3 3 Once word got out about the Ryan's Inn Memorial, I began hearing from people across the country thanking us for remembering him. The emails, I, the emails had been awesome, as I've heard from men who were at West Point with Captain Zinn, those who were with him in Okinawa and Vietnam, and those who will cherish his friendship forever. West Point class of 1962 asked to send a representative to talk about Ryan's Inn, and we are honored to have retired Lieutenant Colonel James McQuillan here with us this morning. So if you could come up here and just say a few words. Thank you, Tim. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, the Zinn family, fellow veterans, fellow classmates, and the Boy Scouts of America. On behalf of the West Point class of 1962, I want to give a special thanks to Timothy Colts, the Boy Scout troops 383 and 442, the village of Orland Park, and the volunteers that helped build this wonderful tribute to Ron Zinn. Timothy, would you please come forward? Timothy, I, ha Timothy, I have here a certificate of recognition for your efforts on behalf of Ron Zinn, and I'd like to read it to you. Certificate of recognition for community service. The West Point class of 1962 is pleased to recognize Timothy G. Plotz, BSA for the outstanding leadership and patriotism in the design, construction, and presentation of the Captain Ronald Zinn USMA 62 Memorial Garden. Signed, Theodore G. Stroop, Lieutenant General, U.S. Army, retired, Class President, 1962. And thank you. I cannot thank you enough for this. This is, this is awesome. Thank you very much, Tim. Congratulations. Thank you. Please have a seat. Ron Zinn was a friend of mine, a West Point classmate, a fellow infantry officer, an Olympian, an all-around good guy. And like 21 other of our classmates was taken from us at far too young an age in the service of their country in Vietnam. I got to know Ron on July 1st, 1958, when we were both assigned to the same platoon for new cadet training, or what was more affectionately called Beast Barracks. Beast was not a lot of fun, the purpose of which, besides from teaching us the basics of being a soldier, was to learn what it was like to be ordered around and harassed, so that when we became officers, we would understand what it was like to take orders and treat our subordinates with the respect that they deserved. The key to getting through Beast was to maintain a sense of humor and take it a day at a time. Ron was great at both, and through it all we had our share of laughs. After Beast, Ron and I went to different regiments, so I only saw him occasionally over the next four years. But when I did, he always had a nice smile on his face and a good word to say. As you know, Ron was a great athlete. I will not go into his many athletic achievements which have recovered elsewhere. However, something most of you do not know, and one of the things that makes West Point unique, is that athletes get few, if any, favors from the athletic department. At that time, we all took the same courses and graduated, and those that graduated received a Bachelor of Science degree in Engineering. A full one-third of the, our class, including many recruited athletes, flunked out. So what Ron accomplished, balancing both his academic and athletic endeavors, was no easy feat. Every class at West Point establishes a motto. Ours was 62 can do, and Ron certainly did. Right before we graduated, we were able to select our branch of service and the location of our first assignment. Ron chose the infantry and requested assignment 
to the 173rd Airborne Brigade in Okinawa. He could have selected a less dangerous branch and a less dangerous assignment, but he wanted to lead troops and always liked the challenge. At the infantry school at Fort Benning, Georgia, there's a large statue of an infantryman, and below it are the words, follow me. Its purpose is to tell future infantry leaders that their job is to lead by example. Ron exemplified that motto by his actions in Vietnam, for which he was awarded a Bronze Star for Valor for Heroism in Ground Combat, a Purple Heart, and a Combat Infantryman's Badge. In closing, I would like to read an excerpt from our West Point alma mater. And when our work is done, our course on earth is run. May it be said, well done, be thou at peace. Well done, Ron, be thou at peace. Another one of the beautiful emails that I received was from Mrs. Loretta Mogan writing from Arizona to tell us how the creation of this memorial touched her heart. Mrs. Mogan's late husband, Bill Mogan, was one of Ronson's roommates at West Point, and she's here to share some of his favorite Ronson stories. So if you could please come up here and share those stories. Actually, I could tell lots of stories, but I'll stick to one. Hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is Loretta Mogan. <clears throat> 49 years ago, a soldier, Captain Ron Zinn, joined the Long Gray Line. May he rest in peace. I would like for everyone to listen to an excerpt that is taken from the Horitzer, the Howitzer, which is the um, um, the yearbook for each class, and this is taken from the class of 1962. And it is by Abraham Lincoln. They gave the last full measure of their devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. The Honorable Malcolm J. Howard asked me to send his regrets for not being here. Mac Howard and Bill Mogan, my husband, my late husband, first met Ron as roommates during Beast Barracks. On many occasions, my husband Bill would rem reminisce the story of how, how Ron's tall, thin torso and long legs affected his gait. Now keep in mind, at that time, West Pointers were world renowned for their marching skills. Bill would explain to whoever listened how Ron's every step was a bounce. The class of 62's marching was punctuated by upperclassmen screaming, stop bouncing smackheads in. <laughs> Several classmates quit, but Ron was holding up well. Three weeks into Beast and after taps, Mac and Bill had Ron marching around the desk in the middle of their room. They studied his motion to see how Ron could reduce his bouncing. His bouncing declined from sheer willpower. Ron displayed exceptional endurance, perseverance, and his droll sense of humor helped him succeed. Captain Ron Zinn was a race walker. Ron died while serving his country on a different walk in Saigon with his men on July 6, 1965. This memorial speaks to the love this town, this area, still hold in their hearts for Ron. Tim, 
thank you for creating this memorial. It is very, very beautiful. Margie, friends, scouts, the whole neighborhood, thank you for this memorial. When I told my great uncle Wayne Klotz, who was also a Vietnam veteran, that I wanted to create a memorial for Ron Zinn, he got very excited. He started sending me emails, making phone calls, and sending Facebook messages. Wayne went to school with Jerry and put me in touch with them. It's been great working with both of them, and we're glad that Jerry came in from Davenport and yours came up from Decatur, and their cousins from Peoria are here too. Please welcome Jerry Zinn. What a day, 49 years ago. I think about it, I thought about it a lot on July 7th. He was killed, the information we received is he was, he was killed on July 7th, killed in action, in his hostile fire in the Binh Hoa district of South Vietnam. And so it was a very sad day, but when I come to that day, I also think that's the same, daughter, my da same day my daughter was born. Night, July 7th, 1978. So it's a happy day, and it's also a sad day. But uh, if Ron were here, he would be so pleased. But he would be humble. And I don't doubt that he might even say there are others more worthy of this than I am. Personally, I'd like to think that across this nation of ours, there are other ceremonies similar to this. Honoring and acknowledging what our soldiers went through in Vietnam, Korea, World War II, and so on. I, of course, you, you've heard thank yous given to everybody so far, but Tim, it's been an honor. To, that's like when he said, introduced to him this morning. I said, Tim, it's an honor to meet you. You will soon be an Eagle Scout. You will never, ever regret that. You go for it. No, excuse me. <laughs> that's unbelievable. If I was in church, it had been turned off. <laughs> Sorry about that. Probably your broker. A little levity here. <laughs> but I need to do the thank yous again for Tim, for his vision. I think when you saw that, the rock and the plaque up on the Humphrey, Humphrey Woods up there, he's thinking about his Eagle Project and thinking maybe there's something else we could add to this. And this started what you see here today. So Tim, it goes without saying that for your vision, I thank you. And I know along the way of getting this all accomplished, your mom, Margie, standing right over there in the blue, had a lot to do with organizing and assisting Tim in any way he could. Because this is not an easy undertaking. There's a lot of organizational skills that involve this, and time, and hours spent trying to contact people and gather information. So I can't help but be proud of you and glad to know you. Gail Blummer is here, and Gail works with the Veteran Commission, <clears throat> and she was the one who was responsible for the creation of the rock and the plaque that set up on Humphrey Woods. And now it's been moved down here. Uh, this is, with this memorial, you know, to my way of thinking, this is where it needs to be now. So when people walk around this, they're going to look at this, which will be unveiled in a little while, and they'll see that there and think, you know, that's, that's pretty neat. Orland Park has remembered one of their fallen heroes and Gail was a part of making sure that we do that. Uh, of course, the Veterans Commission, the Boy Scouts, uh, I was sent pictures by, from Margie of the, when they were doing this, the work that was taking place, the volunteers that worked on this, that I believe it was on a Saturday, they spent basically the whole day doing the mulching, the brick laying, putting the cement down that the bricks would adhere to. So that was a pretty you know, good sized task in itself. So I'd like to thank those volunteers. Now, all of them weren't scouts. I saw several girls in there helping, too. So I want to thank all of them for that. The Village of Orland Park for supporting and remembering.
been a long time. 49 years ago. Even 49 years later, sometimes when I look at things he accomplished, things that I know he did, some of you it's from a military comradeship. For me, he was my brother. So I have a little different perspective. Because when he went away to West Point, I didn't see him very much anymore. Because he was, in that first year at West Point's, you know, the hell year. And I think you guys that are from West Point, you know it's exactly what it was meant to be, to see who would be able to stick it out and go on. And for Ron, that was a challenge. And he was always up to challenges. Always. In high school, you know, somebody said he was a great athlete. Well, yes and no. He was right over here on 151st and West Avenue. I have fond memories of many hours of playing baseball right across the street there. It's originally behind Orlean School, and then we moved out here. And at that moment, I'm thinking of my dad. The OYA, Oral Youth Association. The Little League. When we came to Orland Park in 1953 from Peoria, Orland Park right out here by 143rd and Rainey's Lane. It's a population, Orland Park, 800. That's a far cry from today when, as I would guess, it's probably somewhere 60,000 people and still growing. They're trying to keep up with the traffic out here, but I don't know if that's going to happen. There's just so much traffic, it's unbelievable, from Chicago to Joliet. And that's another thing that I think Ron would agree was great about our own park when we lived here, when we came here. It was 20, about a half hour to Joliet, and many times we go down on the loop in Chicago, and it takes us about 35 minutes to get down there. And yet this area that Ron lived in, that we lived in, was pretty agricultural. And it's kind of hard to see that today with all the growth that's taken place, but that's what it was like then. It was a great place. Orland Park is a great place to grow up. And I think my sister would well agree that we have a spot in our heart, and always will, for Orland Park. The people we met here, the friendships we made, the activities we were involved in, and today, to still be remembered all these years later. We haven't lived around here for quite some time. We get back here periodically. Uh, our first home was right down here at the railroad tracks, just on the other side of the railroad tracks, which used to be called Bean Hill. If you're an old Orland time resident, you remember that, that, but that was our first place that we lived. You know, while I'm thinking about it, part of the honor guard out there, former, former veterans right there, I want to thank you guys for being here today. I know there's about five other places that they're involved in today. So again, guys, thank you. I appreciate that. Didn't mean to overlook that. Uh, with me also, my wife, Teresa, my sister, Joyce from Decatur, her family, Veronica, She's probably happy I called her Veronica because everybody else calls her Ronnie Ann. And Kevin calls her, what do you call her, Kevin? Vern. Vern. Okay. <laughs> but she's a sweet gal. And, of course, I've got some cousins here from Mundelein. There's Rilla. Thank you, Rilla. My cousin Rhonda, who lives part-time between the United States and France. Uh, she played Mary, Mary, Marie Antoinette in France and London for many years. I asked her last time I saw her, how did it feel getting your head cut off every night? But <laughs> but, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my cousin Connie from Peoria, she always considered Jerry, Joyce, and Ron her brothers and sisters. She was an only child. So that's and she still thinks of us that way today. I'd like to thank Bob Smith right there. We had breakfast together today. Bob Smith and I go all the way back to 1961 when he came to Orland from, I think, Florida. They ran track together, fouled around some, and just have been a friendship all the time. Today, instead of talking about things we used to do, we talked about the medications we're taking, <laughs> how many times we've got to go to the bathroom, you know, got to organize things. Uh, I think that uh, the West Point uh, folks that came, West Point gentlemen, I don't know how many actually were from West Point, but we appreciate, I know there were a lot of kind thoughts sent about Ron, I remembered him to this day. I mean, something happens a long time ago, sometimes they kind of fade from the memory. But obviously Ron was unforgettable, certainly to his family, but obviously to these gentlemen as well. If Ron were here, certainly he'd be very pleased. 
But as pleased as he would be, he'd also be humble. He was that kind of guy. Uh, we came here, as was mentioned earlier, from Peoria in 1953. I fell in tune with this town practically the first day I enrolled at Orland Park Elementary. When kids that I didn't know at that time, Barbara Schmedeke, Mary Barton, Sarah Eber, John Taylor, came up to me, Bob Burson, who's sitting right over there in that bright blue shirt. Thanks, Bob. But when you, uh, you know, have friends that receive you like that, that quickly, it makes it easy to really like the town that you're from, that you're growing up in. Uh, I mentioned the population has exploded around here. Uh, over 60,000 now. Uh, let's see. Ron went to Sandberg in 1954. As was mentioned, he was our most valuable athlete in 1957. He participated as a 150-pound offensive line guard. Tim, can you imagine that? I believe he was either all-conference or honorable mention second team, but that's pretty well. But he knew football was not in his future. He also excelled at wrestling. He had a pretty good record his senior year, and he wrestled for a year or two at West Point. You'll never meet a guy who is more determined so one thing I say, I was going to say he was not all that athletic, but what he lacked in skill, he made up for with his determination. He loved a challenge. If you put a challenge in front of him, he was going to meet that. He was going to accept as a challenge, and he was going to go forth from there. Um, just one little side note that lets me brag just a little bit. When I was a sophomore at Sandberg, Ron held two records there for the mile and the half mile. They were both broken by me. And when Ron saw me, he said, at least the name Zen is still on those records. Now that goes back quite a few years, and I'm sure by now those records are like old milk. You know, they're just, they're not too relevant anymore. And you're talking about a 206 half mile, they're probably running under two miles. Uh, it's just the way times have changed. But it was, it was kind of neat. Uh, you know, get some medals, you get a little name of the paper, blah, blah, blah. Uh, where did he get this determination? I don't know. I, I just figured it was in his genetic makeup, his DNA. He just loved a challenge. And he also had that sense of humor that they said was droll. Well, I, the times I saw him using his sense of humor, it was pretty wild. Uh, I remember one particular trip that we took from here down to almost Keokuk, Iowa, where our grandparents lived. My, and my brother, from about the age of 10 or 11, went to the grandparents' farm every summer, much to the chagrin of my mother, because that meant he was gone the whole summer. But he was down, and I think he learned some discipline from his grandfather. Uh, in fact, the grandfather one time said, Ron, is better and more hardworking than any hired man I've ever had. And he was doing it without pay. He just loved that kind of stuff. Uh, in my genealogy research, you know, Ron is military. He wanted to be military. What made him want to go to West Point? When did that motivation begin? I, sorry, I don't really know. The only thing I have sometimes to look back to, and I hope I find the picture from Margie somewhere if they get the museum, Veterans Museum going, is a picture of Ron in 1944, dressed up in a military uniform from head to toe, the hat, the whole bit, the badges, and he's given a salute as a five-year-old boy. And I've wondered several times, was that picture the start of it? I mean, when I look at that, I mean, that's just a, a beautiful picture. But he was self-motivated. He wanted to go to West Point. He didn't make it the first time. He was first alternate. So he went out here to Mount Vernon, Iowa, and went to Cornell College for a year. He took the test the next year. Fourth alternate. Thinking, hmm, not good. But somehow, Congressman, I believe his name was Ed Derwinski, decided he's been here twice, he's serious about it, and so he chose Ron to go to the point. And I'm sure to this day, Ron would never have regretted going to the point. He's buried there. Now, when, you know, he had, he'd only been married for six months to Barbara. 
He went to Okinawa briefly and then off to Vietnam. And the story about loyalty. Somebody mentioned it was that he died trying to save somebody else. It was his point man that he was trying to save. A week before, there had been a big track meet between two different companies. Ron had been in a couple events and won them both handily. And they needed somebody to run the mile. And the guy they had, they didn't think could win it. So Ron got in the race too. And the guy that they didn't think would win it was leading, but he was struggling. Coming around the last lap, one of the young men from the other company was starting to overtake him. So Ron just got in front of him. And every time that guy tried to pass, Ron just practically moved the guy off the track. So his friend, who became, it was, uh, I've got a picture when Sergeant Howard was given his sergeant stripes. He was his point man. And on this particular day, I remember Ron would say, the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese, they had lob shells into their camp. And we'd go out, we'd search, they'd disappear. Well, I look back on it now, that was Viet Cong's strategy. Because one of these times, they weren't going to disappear. And on our calendar, July 6th, July 7th, they lobbed the shells in. Ron and I think 10, 12 others went out to, they call search and destroy. And first one to get hit was his friend, Sergeant Howard. Not only his point man, but his friend. And instinctively, maybe against training, but instinctively he felt the need to rescue Sergeant Howard again. And in his process of getting over to the body, he was hit several times and died right there. In an article that I've read, it was, the guy said you couldn't get your head six inches off the ground, there's that many bullets flying. So that day, you know, will go down and in, in my mind forever is the day that we lost a great American. And I, somebody said, you know, he did so much. And I said, well, 58,000 others are just as deserving. They didn't go over there to die. They went over there, maybe they were drafted, but many of them were there to serve their country. So he died for a friend, and he died for his country. And if you're alive today, he'd do it all over again. I have no doubt. Uh, I know I'm going a little long here, but one of the things about his determination in race walking, he became you know, a champion. I mentioned to several people, he walked in Madison Square Garden. Pretty big location to be competing against the best in the world. And he walked that mile around those boards at that time in six minutes and 16 seconds. And there are a lot of people who can't even come close to that running. But one of his competitors says, the thing about Ron Zinn, I might have better technique, I might be actually faster, but he beats me with his competitiveness, the challenge, the determination. That's why he was so good. Those ingredients right there. What would he have accomplished? If you're here today, it's mere speculation. But I think he'd have gone on to do even greater things. But in his 26 years, he did a lot more than a lot of people will do in their lifetime. That's just a, uh, one little story that I'm going to get off here. Ron's sense of humor has been mentioned a couple of times. I guess it was, and I'll give you two quick stories. We're going to see my grandparents. We're going across Highway 136 between McLean and McComb. I don't know if any of you know the route, I know some of you do. But Ron had been up the night before out doing things guys his age are doing. It's not sleeping. So we're going down to my grandparents. We're going across 136. And all of a sudden, he starts dozing off. And we hit the shore. I yell at him. I'm awake. I yell at him. Ron, Ron, wake up. So, whoop, whoop, whoop. Thanks, thanks, thanks. You know, and we talk some. About 15 minutes later, we're going along that same road, still not to Macomb, and we start going to the shoulder again. We just bought the edge, and I yell, Ron, Ron. And he does this. Yes. One eye closed, one eye open. Sense of humor. Just, and we laughed about that. Just uh, a good memory. Uh, you know, as good as he was athletic, I will be honest with you. He wasn't a very good driver. I rode with him a couple times, and thankful when I got back on solid ground. He came home in 1964 with a brand new Fiat that he bought, a little puddle jumper, four speed, that I think he didn't think it needed brakes. He'd do everything with a gear shift lever. So we're going into Orland Park down Route 45, and he's going too fast. 
and all of a sudden something in front of us develops and rather than going breaking sooner he just started down 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 shifting that thing and letting it out he got stopped and I think does not this car have any brakes but that's he was not a particularly good I rode him a couple other times but in a 48 Chrysler Wow talk about the difference a 48 Chrysler to a 64 Fiat but I digress One thing I'm just going to wrap up here and say that he'd only been married six months. He'd accomplished a lot. He was humble. He was serving his country. And I've thought several times, you know, I'm just so proud to share his last name. So proud. He was a super individual. And I'll never forget him, and I hope you never will either. Thank you. <coughs> I also have a few more dignitaries to introduce. Uh, from Orland School District 135, we have Board President Joe Lamargo. Can you just wave your hand and show where you are? Wearing the Cubs jersey, we gotta get him a Sox jersey. Uh, for also from School District 135, we have uh, Board Vice President Mike Carroll, but I don't think he can be here with us today. But he is also a Scoutmaster in my Boy Scout troop. And from Community Consolidated School District 146, my uncle, Board Secretary Dean Casper. Happy birthday, Uncle Dean. And the Mokina Park District Board President and my godfather, Dennis Bagden. He's all we just left. But um, we also have Mr. Ed Barrett. He's the Director of Institutional Advancement at Providence. He was also here on June 28th helping us build the memorial. He's hiding back there in the corner. So thank you to those guys. And then we also have the Troop 3D3 Scoutmaster, Jerry Klotz. He's right there my dad. So if um, Jerry and Joyce can please come up here so then we can unveil the plaque. Now, Father Richard McGrath, President of Providence Catholic High School, will offer a blessing. The single word that comes to my mind after listening to all the wonderful speeches and seeing this great gathering of people here is the word is self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice is the key to our civilization, if you think about it. Everything that is done, that's creative, that's good, that builds something, is based on the sacrifice of the individuals who are involved in it. Captain Zinn and many others sacrificed themselves that we'd have a free country, that we'd be here today. We don't have to worry about someone knocking on our door in the middle of the night to take us away, or any of those things like that. Self-sacrifice. Many people self-sacrifice for us in our own lives every day, don't they? Our parents, our teachers, our policemen, our firemen. We call upon our soldiers to make great sacrifices too, and our veterans who were soldiers in their own turn, to serve and to sacrifice. Too often, we ask them to make the ultimate sacrifice. And so we remember Captain Zinn today for all that he did, that the air is free and the sky is blue, the sun shines. 
and the police, the firemen are here to protect us, not to guard us. I look around this gathering of all these different kinds of people, especially you veterans and other officials, don't we have a great variety of stories that have brought us to this point? Just an amazing collection of stories and instances of life and how each in his own way has sacrificed and helped build a better community, a better world, and a better country. We send our best and our brightest to defend our country, don't we? We send the best we have, like Captain Zinn. That gives us an obligation. Our obligation is to both be and to become the nation that is worthy of their sacrifice. Now let's offer our prayers to God in honor of, of Captain Zinn that we may reach that goodness. In the name of God, amen. May the grace and peace of God our Father, the source of all blessings, be with all of you. This dedication we make today to enliven our faith and make us grateful to all who are involved in this situation. Wherever we look, to the interest of our neighbor, our community, and our nation to serve them, we are, in a sense, God's co-workers. Let us pray now for God's help through this celebration, that God will bless this project which is now completed, make it a great memorial, not only to Captain Zinn, but to all who have served our country and continue to do so today. We read the words of the letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. For we are God's co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a wise master builder, I lay the foundation, and another is building upon it. But each one must be careful how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one that is there, namely our Lord Jesus Christ. The response for today is, our help is from the Lord. Repeat, our help is from the Lord. I lift up my eyes toward the mountains, Whence shall come my help? My help is from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. My help is from the Lord. May he not suffer your foot to sleep. May he not slumber who guards you. Indeed, he neither slumbers nor sleep, the guardian of Israel. My help is from the Lord, our God. The Lord is your guardian. The Lord is your shade. He is beside you at your right hand. The sun shall not harm you by day nor the moon by night. Our help is from the Lord, our God. The Lord will guard you from all evil. He will guard your life. The Lord will guard your coming and your going, both now and forever. The Lord, our God, is our help. My brothers and sisters, we ask our God, our all-powerful Father, that the dedication we make today will contribute to the building up of God's kingdom and join us all together in faith and in support for our country. The following invocations, please answer, Lord, hear our prayer. For Captain Ron Zinn, that he may rest in peace, that his sacrifice may be remembered, and that his family and friends may take consolation in his loss by the support they see all around us. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For his parents, Lloyd and Beverly Zinn, that they also may take pride in their son's great achievements and sacrifice, and may be remembered with the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who sacrifice their lives for the freedom that we enjoy and take for granted every day, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the spirit of dedication and love of country, like Captain Sin had, may per permeate our lives, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all those who have served our country in any manner in uniform or outside of uniform, who have made sacrifices for our freedom, may be supported and consoled and brought close to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all those who visit this place, who think about its meaning and pray here, may be inspired by the life and sacrifice of Captain Zinn, let us pray to the Lord. For these United States of America, that we may always benefit these days of freedom and appreciate the sacrifices which created them, let us pray to the Lord. 
For all those who have contributed to bring this day to fruition, let us pray to the Lord. Lord God, all-powerful and merciful Father, you have created all things through your Son and have made him the unshakable foundation of your kingdom. Through the gift of your great wisdom, grant blessing to this dedicated memorial today and grant that the undertakings we have completed for your glory and our own well-being may make progress day by day to our successful completion and our appreciation for all we have. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Thank you very much. Uh, still good morning. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, if Joyce would come up along with Jerry. Um, and I want to say a special thanks to a lot of my friends that showed up there. Uh, one of the organizations uh, had like six or seven different things going on today and sending off troops and welcoming home troops is uh, part of the things that they do. And they took the time out some far as uh, way north. Otto, where are you from? Wonder Lake, all the way down here for this. And thank you from the bottom of my heart for you guys showing up. But on uh, behalf of the Special Forces Association, um, Joyce, I'd like to give you a challenge point uh, from the Special Forces Association, and the same to you, Jerry. Um, I'm long-winded, but uh, I'll, I'll make this real quick because I see a lot of sweating people out there. If you do go to the wall uh, in Washington, go to 2E, line 30, and that is where you'll find um, uh, Ron's uh, number. And in closing, the only thing I would have to say, and I, can, I know I can say it on behalf of Ron, uh, with all due respect to the other organizations out there, but that's Go Army. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now if our friend Carnavelli would please come up and sing one more song. Please join me in God Bless America. God bless America. Land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains, to the prairies, to the oceans, white with foam.